Good morning, church. Good morning. So glad to be back with you all. Uh, you know, it's funny, there are very few places I feel more comfortable than in the pulpit. And um, even after a one Sunday off, I come back and it's kind of weird getting back in the group. In our first service, I was fumbling around and looking for my stuff. And I said, what happened to me? I was going for one Sunday. But it's a, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. And, um, and you all look great as we enter into the month of May. Time is flying by and springtime is on us. Praise God. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for the many blessings in our lives. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship today as a community of faith, a community of believers, um, to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. God, to hear your spoken word and to hear your, your praises being sung. God, we are, we are blessed beyond measure. We ask that you help us to be totally present here. God, help us to um, leave any unnecessary distractions behind at the door so that we can be totally present in this moment at this time to put our full attention toward worshiping you, God, and lifting up your holy name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now our call to worship, if you'll follow with me in your bulletin. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was, he was buried, he was, was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. God also highly exalted Jesus. He gave him the name that is above every name. God put all things under his feet. He made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. As all die in Adam. So, so all will be made alive in Christ. Thanks be to God who, who gives, gives us the victory. victory. Please stand as you're able and join us in the first hymn, Nothing But the Blood, page 362. Amen. 
If you would like to turn to page 12 of your United Methodist hymnal or follow along on the screen in front of you, we will now celebrate the Holy Eucharist, service of word and table two. You will notice we are all robed up today. Uh, we made the determination that uh, on communion Sundays we will wear our robes. So on other Sundays we'll go back to our normal uh, attire, but you'll see us on communion Sunday wearing robes because it's a special occasion. It's a sacrament after all. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth, in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here in a moment, I will step down to the table along with uh, Miss Seal Holstead to serve Holy Communion. We will serve the choir and accompanist first, and after that you all may come forward and receive the bread and wine, uh, line up along the communion rail and receive um, the bread and wine. It's juice, there's no alcohol, it's not wine. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the ceremony, you hold your hand out, you'll be given a piece of bread. Um, I say, this is the body of Christ given for you. You say, amen, then you receive the juice. You consume it and say, amen. Um, 
We, have, we share an open communion table in the United Methodist Church. All are invited to participate. Um, all those who uh, earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. And by you coming forward to the communion rail, that is, my, that is your signal to me that you do indeed uh, meet those criteria. So at this time, we will uh, open up the table.
Amen. 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 At this time, we'll dismiss the kids who want to go to Children's Church. Uh, Miss Amy has a, has a lesson for them. They'll be back at the end of the service. Please stand as you're able and join us on page 762, uh, Psalm 30. Stole you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, o Lord my God, God I cried to you for help, and you healed, healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. For Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O oh Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You, you hid your face, I was dismayed. For the night we bring with the morning light of joy. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What, what profit is there in my death if I go down, down to the pit? pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Father, Lord God, we thank you for the many, many blessings in our lives, for all that you have bestowed upon us, your children. God, we thank you that you alone, through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit, have the power to turn our mourning into dancing and to loose our sackcloths and to gird us with gladness. Lord, it is true that our souls may praise you and not be silent. God, we will give you thanks forever. God, we ask today that you be with our congregation, that you be with those who are among our circle of friends and colleagues and acquaintances, those who may be suffering various afflictions of uh, physical illness, mental illness, psychological illness, or various other forms of sickness and distress. God, we ask that when it's in your favor, Restore these to full health, mentally, physically, emotionally. And God, when it's not in your divine plan, we understand that. But in those times, God, we ask that you will bring about that peace that surpasses understanding for those who are enduring these great difficulties. God, we're traveling this rough and rugged road through life, and we can't do it on our own. God, we know that like the footprints in the sand, you are there to carry us when we cannot walk ourselves. And we are forever thankful for your strength, for your grace, for your mercy. 
God, we ask that you lead, guide, and direct us in all we do as a church. We can see your work among us. We see your hand at work in our church, in our community, among us, within ourselves. And God, we pray that you will continue with this. Help us be the best congregation that we can be. Help me to be the best pastor that I can be. Help us to be the best church that we can be so that in our own little pocket of the world, we can do everything in our power to make the world a better place and to bring people to have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. God, it's through your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Stand as you're able and join us in our second hymn, Thy Word is a Lamp, page 601. scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 5 verses 11 through 14 then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with a full voice worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. If you'll stand with me for the reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others, 
of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you, because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Our second New Testament reading this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. 
The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Heavenly Father. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity and the responsibility to bring your word today. God, I ask that you will guide me in all that I say, prop me up when I am weak, and keep me strong, yet hide me behind the cross, God, so that all things will be to your glory and not my own. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I mentioned earlier that I'm coming back from having a week off. And how interesting it is trying to get back in a groove. Even after, even after one week off, you're trying to get, regain your focus. Well, I had a sermon prepared. And I wrote it, and I thought, this is a good sermon. I got up this morning, and I began to read over it and look over the outline. And I thought, I, just, I don't like this. You know, I, just, I don't like the transitions. I don't like the, I don't like the imagery I'm using. So I, I, I thought, I've got a couple of hours, I could, I could adjust it or, or do something different, but I thought, no, I'm going to go with it. You know, that may be, there may be people in the congregation that need to hear this message today, and that may be the devil in my ear trying to get me to abandon that sermon that I, that I carefully prepared. So in the first service, I started to preach the sermon, and I got, you know, a little ways into the sermon, and I realized that was not the devil in my ear, that was a bad sermon. However, at that point, I was too invested. I had to push forward through it. And uh, so I made a game time adjustment between services, and uh, I'm bringing a slightly different message this morning to you all. There are a few uh, key points that I want to make today. Um, We're going to be going through the book of Acts for the next four, five, six weeks. And this is the story. The book of Acts is the story of how the church came to be. Once Jesus was resurrected, Um, He appeared to many, and the book of Acts walks us through how his disciples went forth and established the church. A key figure in this story is Saul, who later became Paul. And Paul is the author of most of the epistles of the New Testament, and those that he did not author himself, several of those were authored by people who were close to him. So he was very influential in the early church. But that's the Saul that we're talking about in today's text. Before God made him Paul, he was known as Saul. Now Saul, admitted by his own admission, was not kind to the early Christians. Now at this point, uh, when we get into our text today, we're in in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And... Up to that point, he had been persecuting the Christians who weren't quite yet known by the term Christians. They were called the way, very much like John Wesley's early movement was simply a holiness movement that later became the Methodist Church, 
but it wasn't originally established as a church. It was simply a new way of going about personal holiness and um, fellowship with the Lord. That's where the Christians were at this time. They were in a movement that was uh, collectively known as the way. And Saul was a major persecutor of them. Uh, Saul had, uh, had studied under Gamaliel, who was a major figure at that time, a Jewish leader, a rabbi. And Saul, by most accounts, was his highest pupil. He was his closest, best student that he had. Saul was very well versed in Eastern philosophy and Jewish theology and the law and the prophets. Saul was a highly um, intelligent, educated man, but he was deeply devout to the traditions of the Jewish um, synagogue. So when these people were going around saying that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, who was actually very God indeed, and he was risen, and he fulfilled all the prophecies about the coming Messiah, Saul was first one on board to go round these people up, throw them in prison, and have them killed. An example of this is given to us a couple chapters before this, in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, a man named Stephen, who was a follower of Christ, and he was speaking in front of the Sanhedrin and giving a testimony about Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God. Those are the, the, the elders and the, and the scribes and the priests were furious with what Stephen was telling him. To them, it was blasphemy. And at one point, um, Stephen looked up and he said, Look, behold, I see heaven opening up like a curtain, and I see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And that was just the very, that, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. They were absolutely furious. They rushed Stephen, they bound him, they imprisoned him, and they stoned him to death while he was proclaiming Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. But it says in that text that as these things were taking place, those who were stoning him to death laid their cloaks at the foot of Saul. So Saul was right there encouraging this persecution of the early Christians. He was the number one person. He had already driven most of them out of Jerusalem, and now he was following them to Damascus as well. He was going to tolerate none of this. So in our text today, he's on that road to Damascus with a, what is essentially an arrest warrant for anybody who is proclaiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior to be bound in chains, imprisoned, um, uh, a, uh, prosecuted, and possibly executed. Now, on this path, this light comes to him that is so bright that it blinds him and stops him dead in his tracks. And he says, who are you, my Lord? He knows who it is. He's educated. He knows what he's doing. He knows who it is, but he's terrified. He says, who are you, my Lord? And what did the voice say? Saul, Saul, it's me, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Why are you persecuting me? And I think at that moment, Saul realized he wasn't just persecuting the early Christians. He was persecuting the true risen Christ. And at that moment, you can't turn back from that. There are certain things you see and hear and experience that you don't come back from. And having that, that intimate experience with Jesus Christ, you don't come back from that. And he knew right away that he had to change, that he had been wrong, all that he had done was wrong, and he was blinded for three days. This is a common motif in the New Testament. He was blind, and later he could see, right? This is common um, for, for many of the, the prophets um, in the New Testament. So he goes to Damascus, to the house that Jesus ordered him to go to, and at the same time, Jesus appeared to another man named um, Ananias. And he said, Ananias, guess what? We, there's a man named Saul who I sent. He's blind. I blinded him, and I sent him to this house, and he's waiting on you to come lay your hands on him and, and, you know, and to, to heal him, to tell him about me. You can imagine what Ananias must have been thinking because it was no secret what Saul was doing throughout the region. He was persecuting people and having them executed. And now Jesus is telling him, you want me to go to this man and lay my hands on him and ask him, do you have a few minutes for me to tell you about my friend Jesus? I don't think that's going to go well. But nonetheless, he did it. 
He said, here I am, Lord. I'll do it. That's the faith that Ananias had. He knew he was walking into a bad situation. But because Jesus commanded him to do it, he had the faith and the confidence that he had physical protection and spiritual protection, that he could walk into what was essentially a den, a lion's den, and walk right into the middle to the, to the king of the lions himself, lay his hands on him, and tell him about Jesus. That's exactly what he did. He goes in, he, lay, he puts his hands on him, and, um, and Saul gets up, he's baptized, he begins to proclaim the Lord Jesus as his uh, risen Savior, and something like scales fell from his eyes. He was blind, but now he could see. And now this same Saul, who had been persecuting the early Christians, was going throughout the region establishing churches. That's what the book of Acts is. It's a, it's a commentary on how these early churches were established. Now this is not unlike what we're in today. They were asking the same questions then that we ask now. Um, at the time, Paul would go around. I'm going to use Paul and Saul interchangeably because I'll, I'll mistakenly do it anyway. Same person, Paul and Saul. Paul is going around establishing these local churches. And um, he would teach them the doctrine and the history and teach them about Jesus Christ. He would preside over the sacraments. He would baptize the converts and collect the money for the poor and do all these things. But then he would leave. And he would come back um, periodically and do those things. Well, eventually, Paul was thrown into prison. And then the question be began being asked, who's going to do these things? Who's going to carry on the traditions? Who is going to determine what our doctrine is? Who, how are we going to determine um, what writings we're going to use for our, uh, for our collection of teachings? Who's going to teach? What are they going to teach? Who's going to preside over the Eucharist? Who's going to baptize? How are we going to do all these things? And that's the book of Acts. They're figuring these things out for themselves as this young, fledgling little church. Well, those are the same things that we ask today, continually. In the Methodist church, we ask, who's going to teach? And what are they going to teach? Who is going to be given sacramental authority to preside over the sacraments and to baptize? Where are they going to come from? In the Methodist church, just like in the day of Saul, um, ministers come up through the church in order to even begin the discernment process of going into vocational ministry. I think you have to have been a member of your local Methodist church for something like two years, um, something like that. So a lot of what we do today comes directly from the early churches and how they were established. And a lot of it um, was not just clearly agreed on. Um, a lot of it was controversial, um, but they persevered. They tried things, they failed. They tried other things, they failed. And eventually it got to where they had a canon of scripture that they would use and, um, and so on. Well, just like the early church um, in the book of Acts starting today after Easter, uh, two, well, just about right after Easter Sunday, just as the early church was being established, we have another denomination being established in our world today. That's the Global Methodist Church. They are launching today, day one, uh, a new faction of the Methodist Church. We'll be having a meeting about this in, I think, two weeks. Um, we'll put it out in the pipeline this week. We'll have a, a church council, and, um, and we'll discuss these things that I said earlier in the year. I want to wait till after Easter to start talking about this because I try to minimize distractions. But this will be something that we're talking about as well. And with this new denomination, the same questions they're asking. What are we, and even those who don't break away into the global Methodist church and remain United Methodist, these same questions are going to be asked. Who's going to teach? What are they going to teach? Who has sacramental authority? How do we organize the church? And so forth. Now, a lot of these are decisions we're not going to have to make. And we may have quite a bit of time before anything happens. But it's something that we have to be aware of and something we have to talk about. So it's good to go back and review what took place in the book of Acts because it's very much, it's very much serves as a template for what we're doing now. So in our meeting in a couple of weeks, I'll show a video uh, from Bishop Jones sort of outlying where that whole process is. And we'll begin to have these conversations and we'll see how it plays out. Much of it is out of our control. It's out of my control. It's out of your control. 
and I've learned over the years, and I, it's still a growing edge for me, is to not worry so much about things over which I have no control. So I think the best that we can do right now is to stay informed, to know where the process is, where the process is going, and to continually be being in prayer um, for our denomination moving forward. Because the events that are going to unfold over the next two or three, five years will determine our effectiveness in bringing Jesus Christ to the world, to our community, and so forth. The last point I want to make is this. There is nobody in the early church that persecuted the Christians more than Paul did. And yet, who was it that God chose to bring his message to the Gentiles and even to the Jews? It was Paul. He was, there is nobody who is beyond the redemption given to us through Jesus Christ. We all probably know somebody in our circle of acquaintances, friends, family, that have gone astray at some point. And we think if they could only get back into church, if they would only study their scripture, maybe there's something I could have done to help in their lives, to, to help get them on the right path. It may be a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, your child, your brother, doesn't matter. It could be anybody, but there's somebody that you're praying for, you're worried about them. Remember, in our story today, it was Paul himself that Jesus stopped dead in his tracks and blinded him and made it so obvious to him that he had no other option but to proclaim the risen Christ as his personal Savior. There is nobody that I know, there is nobody that you know who is beyond the reach of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. That's very powerful to me. It gives me comfort, and I hope that it brings comfort to you as well. Amen? Amen. this time, could I have our ushers come forward, please, for this morning's offering?
Please join us in our final hymn, Lead Me, Guide Me.
As you have been fed at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And may the blessings you have received from God be always with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.